Hello, my friends. Welcome back to the Gun Show VIP Edition. Now, VIP Edition in a lot of cases is, is words, right? We just call it that because we have a very important person, and I do have a very important person with me. But we're not just that here in this manufacturing space at Podcast Junkies. We have cameras everywhere. We have a beautiful desk. We got parts. We're flying people in from all over the country. It's actually very, very exciting. Now, did I get you excited? If you accidentally tuned in to what you saw on Spotify or YouTube or Apple or Google, it said The Gun Show and you tuned in for muscles or weapons? Because if you did, I apologize ahead of time. I don't have weapons or muscles. Uh, my guest does today and my producer most definitely does. He, he's a kick butt kind of guy. Um, so please stick around. We're talking about manufacture. Manufacture makes everything around us. Uh, and I have written a script today that I'd like to actually read. And I think it's important, especially for you listeners on Spotify right now. I, I want to convey a powerful message. There's a lot of folks out there that we're trying to get attention from. We, we want manufacturing to be cool. How do we make it cool? I've asked Christian a couple of times. He said, well, you got to make it sexy. I'm out of luck. I'm not sexy at all. So I don't know how we're going to make this work. <laughs> but I'm going to bring on some guests that might be. Uh, my guest today is Sexy Man. So, all right. Welcome to the Gun Show podcast that peels back the curtain on the world of manufacturing, revealing the human stories and intricate processes behind every item in your daily life. Did you know that as of the recent data, manufacturing accounts for approximately 16% of global GDP and employs over 20% of the world's workforce? It is a colossal sector that touches every aspect of our lives, yet remains largely unseen and misunderstood. From the smartphone in your hand, crafted with precision and care, to the car you drive, assembled from thousands of parts where across the globe, every object has a story. This podcast aims to tell these stories, bridging the gap between factory floor and your front door. By understanding and supporting manufacturing, we are not just investing in products, but in people, communities, and the very fabric of our daily lives. Join us as we explore the fascinating world of manufacturing where human ingenuity, I said that word wrong, meets technological prowess crafting the world around us. I almost nailed that. I thought it was pretty good, though. Okay, we got real serious at first, and today I'm going to invite you to talk with me and Adam Willia. <laughs> Adam, how we doing, buddy? <laughs> Welcome back to the gun show, my friends. This is the VIP edition. <laughs> I'm doing great, man. You got me stoked, man. <laughs> I feel I'm ready to chew through barbed wire after that intro, man. That was awesome. You like that intro? I, I actually really do. It was the first time I got to do it, so yeah. I'm going to rewrite it a little bit as I go on with this podcast. Ed, but I want to... the word ingenuity so you can cruise through it. <laughs> right? That's the one, <laughs> this is the one tongue twister that got me today. <laughs> so what else I want to do is kind of make this fun, right? So I have a, a couple of really bad jokes we're going to start this oh, off with. Perfect. Um, we're going to leave a slight pause before you even attempt to answer, even if, even if you don't want to. We're going to try. Right. Uh, to let the audience have an attempt as well. So the first one is, why did the manufacturing worker get promoted? Why did the manufacturing worker get promoted? Because he had a lot of assembly experience. <laughs> okay, this one's a little bit better. This one's a little bit better. That one was real bad. <laughs> but we got to do dad it's, jokes. I'm at the age. <laughs> Christian just rolling his eyes He's behind like, the oh, scenes man. back there. I'm going to let Christian answer this one. Yeah. Christian, get your, get your microphone ready. What's a machinist's favorite movie? The Machinist. Ooh, that would be a good one. And that, but that's probably not a joke, right? That, that might be the real answer. The answer is gone in 60 seconds because it's about how quickly their tools disappear. Especially at 10 millimeter. <laughs> yeah, that one always goes away at first, doesn't it? All right, so a couple of bad jokes to start off the show. Adam, I have you here. Obviously, Fanuc is on your shirt. I have personally, I'm sure you have as well, been to Japan, been over to Europe, been here to Michigan. The facilities are phenomenal. They're sexy. Their automation is not the future anymore. It's maybe even we should have started 10, 15 years ago at this point, <laughs> even though a lot of people think automation is the future. Uh, you brought me a cool gift today. If we could yeah, zoom in on this buddy. a little bit, Christian. Thank you so much for this, Adam. This is uh, a cool little Fanuc robot here. Yeah. Definitely going on the swag wall behind me. Appreciate that, Adam. Yes, and then I have a short story. So this piece here that we're looking at, this is a Lego block, a machined Lego block. And we did this on a robo drill with a Fanuc robot arm. And it was from raw block to finished piece and packaged by the end of it. And this was done at AMB in Germany. They were nice enough to gift this to me because we were actually utilizing the air turbine spindle going 65,000 RPM to do small detailed stuff at about, well, we were in Germany, so it would have been millimeter, but let's say about 10 thousandths, 15 thousandths uh, mm -hmm. diameter of the tool making those small cuts. So now that I've uh, 
hyped up this whole thing, Adam. Yeah. I want to know about you. The audience wants to know about you. We're going to bring in some of the fanic stuff as well. Yep. Because before we hit, you know, sat down in our seats, you blew the mind of our, guy, our guys here going, <laughs> well, this is how big fanic is. But before we do that, your journey, your excitement, how did you get here? Do you like where you are? Was it on purpose? Did you mean to be here? Oh, not at all. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> not I at love all. that answer. <laughs> I know, and I'm happy to dive into that. So, yeah, dude, just the, the little 10,000-foot you know, uh, view of myself. Uh, you know, uh, I'm the district sales manager for Fanuc Robotics. So in the Fanuc world, there's uh, uh, the CNC and robo drill cutting, there's injection molding machine, there's uh, all kinds of servo motion. And my world is in the robotic, the robotic side. Um, so I take care of all of the uh, robot customers uh, throughout the state of Florida uh, and throughout the Caribbean. So nice. uh, Puerto Rico, Dominican. Tu hablas oh, español? Uh, 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 si, un poco. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Enough to get by. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> and uh, and so yeah. Um, but but what's 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 cool is my journey was never intended to be sales, nor was it intended to be Florida of all things. And now I'm. A salesman in Florida. Starting in Michigan yeah. growing up, right? Dude, 100%. <laughs> born and raised in West Michigan. And uh, yeah, if, if, if you can't hear from the accent every now and then, you hear the youpers in Sarasota and don't you know, <laughs> yeah, that's 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 the uh, the Yankee in me. But uh, um, yeah, so so honestly, you know, diving into that just a little bit, um, just we can, a little glancing blow there is I actually started out earning my bachelor's of science in electrical engineering. Hmm. So I'm a double E. Uh, you're, you're one of those smart guys. Uh, I, I try to be. I try. <laughs> I, I fooled a lot of people for four years. <laughs> Is that what happened? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so uh, Grand Valley State University out of Grand Rapids, Michigan. Go Lakers. Mm -hmm. And uh, got a job. Uh, and I'll, I'll actually love to dive into this a little farther. But we will. Uh, but but got got a job as a controls engineer out of school. Uh, got sick of the snow and the ice, couldn't handle it anymore. Just another Yankee that got smart and uh, <laughs> ended up moving to Charlotte, North Carolina. Hung out in Char Charlotte, North Carolina, working for Fanuc, having a good time. And then uh, uh, we'll, we should probably touch on this too, but uh, that pivotal moment in life where I decided to go from engineering to that dark side of sales. Mm, yeah. we, we call it that, but it's it's, it's not it quite as side. dark once you get here. <laughs> it's not. There's cookies. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I got tempted was the cookies. Just like Santa Claus, you know? That's yeah, how he got around the world. So, Adam, I want to touch real quick, because you said you didn't mean to be here, yep. uh, the dark side of sales, but you yep. did go to school to be an electrical engineer, yes. which certainly has the word engineer in it, which yep. is kind of what people think about when they think about manufacturing, certainly on the outside. In high school, what kind of a person were you like? Were you that type yep. of student that loved math? Did you despise math? Did you know what you wanted to be when you grew up? Did you know what manufacturing was? Did you have an idea? Dude, I, that is the best question. That's that's the one thing that I really love to talk about, like my nieces and nephews and kids in the STEM labs and everything mm -hmm. in local schools is... I had no clue what manufacturing was, what it meant. I didn't know automation. I couldn't spell PLC. Uh, <laughs> literally had no idea. But at the time in high school, math came so effortless to me. Um, I, I bombed out of you know chemistry and biology, so I knew that was off the table. Um, <laughs> art art and, and and reading and literature and dude, I don't think I ever read a book cover to cover. I, <laughs> if you remember back in the day, SparkNotes.com. Oh, that's, yeah. that's how I survived. Nice. Uh, but dude, when it came to math, I was always in AP math. Um, what was funny is I used to show up to my math classes with nothing, like literally empty-handed, no books, no notebooks, no pens, no pencils, no calculator sit in the back of the room, and if something important popped up, I'd reach over to the recycle bin and grab a piece of scrap paper and just write it down <laughs> so that I could remember it. And dude, I would just ace the, the daylights out of everything. Calculus, you know, pre-calc, calc, calc diffy Q, all that stuff. I was taking college math in high school. So I knew I had a very logical and mathematical oriented brain. Uh -huh. So then it was, how do I make a living out of this? And, you know, that's where, you know, my parents and my peers are like, oh, you got to be an engineer. You know, mm -hmm. you, you got the knack. Mm -hmm. If you've never seen the knack, <laughs> go on YouTube and type Dilbert the knack. It's a funny little joke. But I had that where I could just understand um, mechanics. I could understand. And part of that was probably because of my dad, too. We grew up in a household, maybe just because we were poor, but where we fixed everything. Right. Okay, if there was yeah. a plumbing issue, we were plumbers that day. If there was electrical, we were an electrician. And. Um, and my dad was a motorcycle mechanic, uh, so grew up souping up Harleys and racing dirt bikes and all that. So I, I understood mechanics, I understood fitment, and I was really good at math. And so it, it thrust me into engineering. That's very curious. Christian, how were you at math in high school? 
awful. Yeah. Like, prob- <laughs> probably most people. Yeah, I, I think say. I think a lot of us, uh, me included, when we think about math as a teenager, we're all going, eh, that's my least favorite subject. Mm-hmm. You as well, right, Christian? 100%. Yeah. By far, least favorite. I didn't get very far, but I didn't get very far in the sciences either, to be fair. <laughs> so so school, school was tough for me all around. So you have been... You have been on a really cool path, a trajectory of understanding your own strengths. Uh, I'm going to ask you about a potential weakness. How's your art side since you seem to be very left-brained, right? The only thing that I halfway can do art, and it's not even art, is I can draw comics really good. Can you? I love drawing comics. And part of that was I was so bored in school and so not paying attention that I would draw comics in my other class so I, I could do comics. But as far as like true art you know you go yeah. to a, a you know you go to an, an art museum or you one of these expos or whatever dude don't give me oil don't give me brush there's no way um uh, I'm I'm musically inclined. Uh, I play a lot of piano. Do uh, you? Yeah, piano, trumpet, uh, play play all that, but again, that's math. People don't think of it, but, uh, but a piano is an I didn't. Oct- octaves, whole steps, half steps is very mathematical. You know, one three five is a major chord and it's just it's math. So when I sit down to a, a piano I don't see white and black notes. I see numbers, and and it's hammers and strings, and uh, you know it kind of resonates with me. That's I never thought of it that way. Yep. It's math. That's really cool. Okay, so if do you have any of that artwork still sitting around? I have some on my phone. Do you really? Yeah. So what I'm thinking is, uh, <laughs> as we're talking about this, and if it's possible, I would love for you to send me some of that. I'm gonna have my editing team try to pop that into our conversation right now <laughs> so, as yeah. we're talking. If you pull it up on your phone, maybe yeah, dude, maybe have... Christian can zoom in as well. That's very creative. All right, so here's here's an innocent little one here that I drew of myself walking. Where should I aim it, Christian? This way. Right this way. All right. So this is a a, a comic that I made. And uh, it's actually me on the screen walking my wiener dog. So I, my, my wife and I have two little dachshunds, and uh, I'm telling the dog, man, it, it's it, it's uh, it's hot out today. And then I go, man, I'm I'm kind of hungry. I'm famished. I could really eat a hot dog. And the dog goes, oh crap, and, gets, and he gets super scared because the dog because my hot dog is scared. Yeah. But, but yeah, I, I have all kinds of them. I, I make jokes about customers that don't have budget, and I make jokes about bad movies I've seen, and. Well, let's not show too much of that. Somebody (laughs) might hire you on the spot to start doing comic writing. I actually did a tour of the Walt Disney Museum out in San Francisco, and I, you know, I would when you said I'm not an artist, I would beg to differ because when I saw the wall of how you know shows were being made 50 years ago or so, it was it was what you just showed me. So you have a very creative side as well as well as an analytical side and and programming side. So let's continue on that journey. Yeah. Um, what was the next step? Once you once you got your degree, did you kind of have an idea of what you wanted to pursue with it? So what was uh, what was really interesting is I'll even back that up just before getting my degree. So I I, I decided I'm going for engineering. I nailed that down. While I was in one of my uh, electronics classes, we were supposed to take a trip to a power plant in Holland, Michigan, uh, west side of Michigan, and. Um, Something had happened and we couldn't get into the power plant that day. So now my professor's like, I got a bus full of engineering students. I don't know what to do with them. And uh, professor called up uh, an automation company and said, would you be able to do an impromptu uh, field trip for lack of better terms? I got a group of 18 year old kids here, 19 year old kids. Could we do a, a field trip? Now, remember, at this time, I had no idea what manufacturing was, no idea what automation was. I just knew I was good at math and needed to be an engineer. That's all the guidance I had We're still at that point right now. Okay. We walked into a company that that, that recently sold for $7 billion, but at the time, it was on a dirt road in a barn. It was called JR Automation. Hmm. And JR Automation hosted us. Uh, The president at the time was Brian Jones, and I walked in, and I saw my first robot. You know, pop pop my robot cherry, right? Do Do you mind saying what year this was? This would have been, if I was 18, it would have been 2006-ish. Okay, okay. So, 06 ballpark. Yeah, I was, I had a, I was, my first pro, uh, robot I ever programmed, or cobot I ever programmed, was about 2004 or 5, and we had it okay. stirring coffee. Oh! And, and that's it. That's before I left that company, that was all we had to do. So, I'm so familiar with the with time the, frame of you popping frame. your robot cherry. Yeah, there you go, dude, right? <laughs> so, I walk in, and dude, my eyes just explode, and everyone else is kind of ho-hum, ho-hum, we're on a field trip, it's a, it's a joke day, you know, whatever. And I, I just, like, started melting, I'm like, what? 
are these? You know, I was like, this can't be real. You know, and I was like, do you guys make these? What are these? And I like, no, we buy them. You know, Fanic. And they, a lot of them were Fanic. Were they? Uh, and not all of them, but most of them were Fanic. And Seems re- to be the general rule general in our industry. Rule, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And at the end of the uh, at the end of the uh, tour, Brian, President Brian Jones said to the class, said, "Hey, what do you guys want to do when you graduate?" And everyone sat there silent. And I I pop my hand up and I go that right there. Whatever you got on your floor, that's what I want. He says, "Come talk to me when everyone leaves." Ah. And Brian Jones gave me an internship on the spot. He's no like, "Kidding? You you're hired." I'm like, "Um." I don't know what any of that is, but it looks cool. And so I started as an intern at JR Automation, working my way through college. And that was one of the most beneficial things in my life because I was getting the real world experience of robots, uh, PLCs, HMIs, conveyors, servo drives, vision systems. I was getting that real world experience while earning my degree. So now getting to your part, when I got my degree, did I want to know what I wanted to do? They just took me on full time. You knew. It, it was a formality yeah. at that point. I just needed the piece of paper that said they could hire me. I'm going to take a step back as well with you because along that journey you just described, did you also say dirt road in a barn? Yep. Dirt road yep. in a barn with automation. Yep. Yes, sir. In 2005, six. Yes, sir. And I can show you that in 2024 here in Florida. I've got. I've Would got... you have expected something like that walking into a barn? <laughs> no, dude. Seriously, a big red barn. Like it, it literally it, behind a blueberry field. Nonetheless, this isn't even like if I'm painting the picture here. You, you, it's Tyler Street, which is not like a four lane highway. But <laughs> but Tyler Street was a a gravel road with with uh, blueberry fields on either side, and you forged right down that thing. And dude, in the winter time, you almost needed four wheel drive to get to work. And they sold. They sold at one point to some kind of a private equity firm or a VC firm, but then they sold to Hitachi. You'd have to fact check me, but it was like either four billion or seven billion or something ridiculous. I was employee one eighty three. My badge was one eight three. Wow. Now they've got two or three thousand employees, and they've they're all over. They've got like five campuses in Michigan. They're down in Carolina. They're everywhere. Did you keep that badge? Yeah. I don't, I don't know if I did. Might you be know, a collector's I did. item. I did because with that badge, I kept two pay stubs specifically. We used to get paid weekly. And uh, there were two pay stubs that I kept. And I kept them because both of them were over 90 hours in a seven-day work week. And I need that to sink into you and the listeners, that 90 billable hours in seven days. Well, I you, did that twice. Well, you're, you're charging the robots? Weren't they supposed <laughs> to do that work for you? <laughs> someone's got a commission on man. <laughs> yeah, apparently so, so. Someone's got to program these things. All of us who are taking advantage yeah. of our shorter work weeks, you're putting yeah. in 90 hours to get it done for 90 us. 90 hour work weeks, baby. All right, Adam, what I want to do right now, and we're going to continue on your journey, okay, yeah. but I want to sidestep in just a, uh, for a moment because your passion is infectious. It's mm. obvious to me you walked into a barn when you were supposed to be picking blueberries <laughs> out in a field. That's what you were really supposed to be doing. Yeah. You decided to stray away from your group and walk into the barn and Mm -hmm. see what was in there you found a robot and you fell in love so from your story to a lot of other people's stories they might not fall in love quite that quickly and there are Mm -hmm. definitely people out there that do i mean these these yellow robots we have all around us are are fascinating and and to see what they do in in worlds of of like automotive for example it's an easy one to pick out where you can just see an entire car be put together in an automation line um I want you, if you wouldn't mind, to share a bit of your passion and speak to an audience. Pretend you're talking to Christian. Pretend you're talking to Ben, who who are outside of manufacturing. Mm-hmm. What excites you? What makes this so fun for you and enjoyable where somebody might want to get in on it as well? Yeah, they work 60, 70, 80, 90 hours a week, and they're paying themselves 50 grand. And last time they took a vacation was 1998. This dude has sold out. He, he's, he's all in. So me personally, I cannot wait to visit this shop with you guys. So should we go pay this young man a visit? I think so. Let's, Let's do, do it. it. Let's Come do on, it. Guys. Yeah, 100%. So what really amped me up more than anything about um, robotics and, and automation specifically is you you get to start with an idea. It, it's literally something that's that's not real. It's 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 a thought. It's a brainstorming session, and that idea manifests itself into something real and moving. So so let me let me take that a step. Like 
when I was in college, we were doing a lot of programming classes and things like that. And okay, you write some code, you click compile, yup, the code works, okay, whatever. But when you're working with a robot and you're programming it and you say compile, that robot starts running and zipping and moving things around and there's servos screaming and there's parts being built and just stuff's happening, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's just exciting and kind of scary and intimidating. You're like, I hope I don't crash something. But what's so cool is you can, you can take an idea, someone that says, hey, I need to make this widget, I need to make that thing. And that idea goes onto paper. And then from paper, it goes in, into uh, you know, a computer system and CAD and that. Then it goes to a machine shop and starts getting fabricated. Then it starts getting um, wired and plumbed and programmed. And then before you know it, there's this thing that has never existed. You can't go buy it. You can't go buy that machinery. And, and, and not, it never existed. You can't buy it, but you just manifested it out of an idea. And, and if that amps you up, that you can create something that's brand new and you can be the pioneer and solve problems for the very first time where there's, you can't Google your way through it. You have to solve it. That's what really turned me on is, is like, dude, I'm going to type this code and I'm going to push it to the robot and I'm going to cross my fingers and hope it doesn't rip itself apart, which sometimes I do. I was going to ask you, I was going to ask you that question. Have you done that before? All all good programmers are going to crash. You're, you're going to crash. Um, the president of our company, the, the Mike Chico, the president of Fanic, he always tells a story of where there was this huge, tall stack of, uh, wine glasses and he programmed a a robot that they were picking in place and he hit the stack and just thousands of bottles of wine glasses just, and just everywhere. I mean, imagine the bill, right? Good but, grief. Oh, but, but, but I mean, and, and that's the thing is, I mean, you can be the best. I hope Mike doesn't get mad at me for <laughs> telling that. Sorry, Mike. I love you, man. Let me keep my job, brother. Um, but, but I've done that stuff too, man, where, where, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give mine. I, I used to work, do a lot of work for, um, uh, Magna mirrors. It's a company in, in West Michigan that makes mirrors for, Ford, uh, Toyota, Honda, a- anything for outside mirrors. And uh, we had a, a whole shipment of, of glass come in and we were gonna use robots to assemble and test and inspect. And I, I bet you a, a few thousand pieces of glass ended up on the floor because of Adam Willey. Mm. <laughs> and and I, I have to call, you know, call up Megan and be like, hey, remember those like 3,000 sample parts you sent? Can I get 3,000 more? <laughs> what was that call like? Oh, dude. I mean, it just you just you just cringe. You're sweating before you even pick up the phone. And, <laughs> Your boss is mad, and uh, but you know what? Stuff like that is almost easier to replace than uh, the stuff you build because I've crashed machines too. Yeah, where like I said, somebody had to machine a, a collar or a part or a shaft or whatever, and then I program it wrong and it crashes and it rips itself apart. Now I have to walk to the back of the shop, you know, and tell the guy sitting at the the mill, be like, "Hey, dude, I need you to make me a new one of these collars because, uh, yeah, that robot went straight through it." You know? So, I would I want to make the discussion with you because I've found that as we get deeper and deeper into our professions, we oftentimes and oftentimes it's by accident as well, which is why I'm glad you picked the game that we're going to play later on. Hmm. Uh, called industry jargon, oh, which yeah. is just breaking down complicated <laughs> conversations about manufacturing and and making it simple. But yeah. we do a lot of times. You and I can talk at a very high level. I mean, you're in the industry of Fanic for a while. You went to college for it. I myself have never fully programmed a robot like you have, but I've visited all the locations as I for mentioned sure. before, and and some of your so-called competition as well, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so we get caught talking at, at this level. Mm-hmm. Would you make the discussion that people who love video games could work out really well in the uh, robotics world also? Dude, like, have you seen, uh, I don't know if you or anyone, have you guys seen Gran Turismo? The, the, the newer new, one. The, the new one. Yeah, where it's out? all like, he's actually, dry, that's he's, based on a true story, it's right? It's a 100% true yeah. story. So this dude was, uh, was a gamer and that's all he did was just game. But like he could race Le Mans like thousands of times so he had it memorized mm-hmm. they're like all we got to do is take this guy and like get him in shape put him in a real car and he did he ended up going on being a champion so like i'm going to say that translates a bit like i do see i see a lot of gamers get into software development and and computer sciences um I don't know necessarily that it does or does not help them in the robotics and automation side because their side is probably more of that left that that artistic side okay right? 
like if you're getting into that graphic design and development and things like that, um, the people I see really excel in robotics and automation are more of the tinkerers. People who you, you can same see, people for the CNC world, dude. Then, the pe- tinkerers, the kids who tear apart mom's VCR and then <laughs> yeah. and then you know can't put it back together or whatever. Um, you know, uh, just love the inner workings of well, how does that work? You know, and I remember being a kid trying to figure out how um, our Lazy Boy recliner worked. Like I could see all the mechanisms and springs. I'm like, why is that spring there? And, there? and I'm literally crawling under there. And my dad could hear the tools clanking. He's like, what are you doing under there? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you know? mentioned the frugalness yeah. of when you were growing oh, up as yeah. well. And I, oh, I can yeah. empathize with that. Yeah. In fact, there was a time in my life where I used eBay and yard sales to buy broken things, fix them, and sell them again. Yep. I survived yep. off of selling things, fixing and selling things on eBay for about a year and a half. Totally. So, yeah. so I get that tinker inside, which is maybe yeah. why we're both in this industry. Yeah. Let's continue with your journey a bit, because I do want to oh, yeah. talk a bit about Fanic today, because mm-hmm. you guys are so massive oh, everywhere. And if we can, obviously you're on the robotic side, but we can talk about the robo drill side a little bit as well. Um, but let's continue with your journey. So you were you were person 130 something, yeah, right? Yeah, 183 at, at JR. 183, yeah, and then yeah. it gets bought, expands, yeah, yeah, expands, and you've now moved on to what's next. Yeah. So um, at at one point I'd been traveling way too much and uh, had a a sexy new fiance at home and those 90 hour weeks uh, weren't going over real well. Okay. (laughs) And so uh, I decided I loved my job. I loved my career, but JR was beating the daylights out of me. So I wanted something a little more local. Um, And I started uh, with another automation company in West Michigan uh, called R&D Machine and Tool. And... uh, uh, that again, similar story, controls engineering, programming robots and PLCs and, and, and doing all that kind of stuff. But there was a breaking moment in my life where uh, my wife and I decided we can't be in Michigan anymore. And that was... Do you yeah. want to describe the breaking moment? I will tell you that breaking yeah? moment. We get that, we get that on here yeah, today. I like right. that. The breaking moment, because life was good. Life was good. We had a beautiful house. My wife was a nurse. I was an engineer. We were, we were dinks, dual income, no kids. Life was good, right? Dead middle of winter, probably January, February, you know, it, 10 degrees outside with a wind chill of negative 15. Uh, up north, Myers is the main gas. There's the main uh, grocery store, like Publix. Okay, yep. Publix of the North is Myers. Okay, and uh, we're walking out of, of Myers with our grocery cart full of, of of groceries, and the wind is whipping and just <laughs> icing up my eyes and nose, and 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 the cart I can't push it because it's like <laughs> slush and ice and snow, and and I'm freezing and I'm wet and I'm cold, and the cart like hit something and like tipped over, and all the groceries go on the floor on the on the p- wet pavement, and I'm just like. My wife's name is Nicole. I'm like, Nicole, you want these groceries? You put them in the truck. I'm going home. You know, like I like snapped. I'm like, I'm so sick and tired of of living this life, you know. And, and we got home and we sat down. And we're like, dude, like we got to get out of here before we get too rooted, you know, because mm. we were in our 20s. Um, it was it was just us, you know, you know, no kids, no nothing. Well, just us. Our whole families were there. So that was the, the band. That's what keeps rip. a lot of people in the Midwest. Right, right. right. And it was so hard. Right. Tight uh, Midwest family. And my wife and I were like, dude my wife loves fishing. Mm -hmm. She loves beaches. Mm -hmm. She loves kayaking and hiking. Me, I love motorcycles, whether it's motocross, hair scrambles, GNCC, whatever, Harleys. I want to be on a bike. She wants to be on a beach. And we lived in snowy, frozen Michigan. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just said, you know what? This is going to suck, but it's it's for for the better. Uh, And so we picked up and moved, and we moved down to Charlotte, North Carolina. And that pivot is when I started working for Fanic. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's, I'm not from Michigan. Okay. But I've traveled there quite a bit. Oh, yeah. Am I wrong in thinking that the west side of Michigan is also the colder side with more snow coming off the water there? Lake effect snow. Yeah. Dude. It, it would, you know how Florida, like in the summer, it typically rains every single day at four o'clock? For about an hour. For about an hour. Yeah. Okay. That was Michigan snow all winter long. Every single day, you basically just get snow. It was miserable. That sounds fantastic. No, I'm just kidding. Not for me either. I like <laughs> beaches terrible. as well. I'm with your wife, yeah. and I like motorcycles. Yeah. I like you. Yeah, that's a that's a good call. So, so we're now in Charlotte. So now we're in Charlotte. Yeah, and and and, and I'm going to fast forward a couple years of life because again, I moved to Charlotte. I started working for Fanic, um, which was a huge honor. I was just shocked they would even hire a you know a little nobody. They from saw Michigan. something they, in you. They saw something, man. Uh, they brought me on, and um, here's what was kind of pivotal. Uh, again, 
we loved our life. We lived on Lake Norman. We had a jet boat. Mm. Wife was still a nurse. I'm still an engineer. Like life was good again. Let's just stay here forever. And my boss, um, Hey Adam, what do you think about going into sales? I'm like, no, no way. I told him absolutely not. Never. No way. I said, I can't even sell a candy bar when I was in the Cub Scouts, right? <laughs> like go door to door. Like, Will you support the Cub Scouts? Yeah. No, I can't sell. I'm like, I'm not a sales guy. I can't sell. And he's like, well, you might want to think about it, dude. I think I, I, his name was, is, he's still with Fanic. Uh, his name's Dick Motley. And Dick would come to my office. Hey man, you think about sales yet? You think about sales? No, no, dude, I don't want to. I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm good. And he keep bugging me. And uh, finally he, he came and he said, look, I just got corporate approval. I have to hire another guy for the Southeast because the Charlotte office t- takes care of the whole like SEC. He said, we're growing too big. We're going too fast. We need a sales guy. I'm like, all right, what's what's the catch? What do I got to do? He says, the catch is you have to live in Florida. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Hold on a second. That so, doesn't sound so I, bad, I'm does like, it? Like, yeah, yeah, I'm like, hold on, Dick. Let me go talk to Nicole. <laughs> and uh, so I, I went home and I told her, I'm like, babe, what do you think about moving again? Now, we had, we'd had only been in Charlotte for like two years. Like we were just getting settled in. Life was good. And, and she's like, oh, well, let's go check it out. And we went to Florida and we checked it out. And I'm not going to lie, we hated it. Did you? Hated it. What well, didn't you like about it? We're like, this is a bunch of old people and Disneyland <laughs> tourists. And I'm like, this sucks. It was hot and sticky and and old people. I'm like, no way, man. And so uh, I, I came back. I told Dick, I said, I'll make you a deal. I says, I'll go into sales and I'll I'll move to Florida and I'll 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 sell your robots in Florida. That's cool. But as soon as you get an opportunity for me to come back to Charlotte and be a sales guy back in Carolina, bring me back. Huh. And he goes, okay, sounds good. So uh, moved down to Florida, and dude, I'm gonna tell you, once Florida gets its hooks in you, I actually got that opportunity to go back to North Carolina, and I said no. I said no. We're Floridians now, man, through and through, man. What what hooked you about Florida? Oh, before we do that, yeah. you may as well go ahead and just turn that Darth Vader head around because yeah. go, oh, join in the dark, dark side. side, right? Oh, <laughs> you join the yeah. <laughs> let the darkness consume you. <sighs> <laughs> so yeah. what what were the hooks yeah. of Florida? What what attracted you? Dude, once we got like for so for us we live in the Bradenton area, so just south of Tampa and like man, lovely like, area. Oh dude, hanging out at Siesta Key beaches yeah. and St. Armands and you know, buzzing up to St. Pete Clearwater in Tampa and, and just the food scene and um again, you know, my, my wife could get out on the boat and the beaches and dude, I've I can ride my motorcycle three hundred and sixty five days. I've never golfed before. I started golfing. I love golf now. <laughs> like I, I golf, I ride dirt, I, I ride road. And so what happened is like all of a sudden we just started like getting fit. Like we literally lost weight. We were healthier, happier, and we're like, wait a minute, this is awesome. It's it, it, by the way, this is not a sales pitch. Please don't move to Florida. <laughs> we, we have we have Florida. Too awful. many people. There's, yeah. there's alligators and pythons and love They're bugs. They're gonna eat you. Yeah, yeah. This is definitely gonna eat you. This is not a sales pitch for it's Florida. It's way too hot. It's, mosquitoos it's are huge. Oh yeah, the mosquitoes are. Yeah. In fact, Florida <laughs> sucks. Nobody should ever live here. Yeah. But uh, no, it did. It got its hooks in us, and now now we're just we're like here to stay, man. I just I love it, and and I'll be honest too. I think a big part of it is the friends I've made through business. Um, being in sales, my it's not like you you hear sales and it's such a n- negative term, right? They think of door to door, you know, vacuum cleaner guys. My kind of sales is solution based. Mm-hmm. All right, I'm an engineer. I think like an engineer. I go into a, my day to day life is an episode of how it's made, right? right? You get to go in and see these factories where weird stuff is made from, from trach tubes to, to pacemakers, to dog biscuits, to diapers, to guns, to grenade launchers. Like I've seen some of the craziest stuff you can ever dream of in Florida, by the way. Um, and I get to go there and help these guys improve their process. Like, hey, what kind of problems do you have making these closet racks, you know, or making these coffee mugs? What, you know, what do you got? You know, okay, well, let's take a look at it. And it's solution-based selling. And I'm like, well, you know, I can't solve all your problems, but I sure as heck can solve these right here by putting a robot here, takes your labor pool, and you don't replace them, you displace them. Say, the people you have putting the widget in a box all day or taking in and out of a machine, let them go and start doing some of the clerical work, you know, or, or mm-hmm. let them, you know, let them keep the robot fed, you know. And so what happened is as I'm going around doing solution based, I started making friends. 
more friends than we got time on this show for me to tell. But, dude, I, I love the people I work with. I, I love the integration companies who, who take our robots and put them in machines. Um, I, I love the end users who have them on the floor. I'm just having too much fun. So the, the job was fun. It's stressful. It's long hours, but it's, it's, it's fun. Um, it, it's eternal paradise. I'll be on my dirt bike this weekend. If I was in Michigan, I'd be shoveling snow this weekend. I was just going to ask you, you haven't uh, crashed any uh, grocery carts lately in the <laughs> snow, have you? <laughs> nope, haven't done that in a long time. So what I want to do, Adam, from here is I think it would be remiss of me not to, you know, uh, talk about Fanuc uh, mm -hmm. on a, a little bit bigger level. Um, I'm sure there's an audience yeah. right now that has been very excited about your story. You're, you're very passionate about what you do, and thank you for being that type of person. We yeah. need more in the industry like you for sure, so thank you for that. Yeah. But there's definitely some people out there right now that are sitting in their machine shops thinking about automation. Yep. What What should I do? How should I go? So would you mind talking about the amount of history, the amount of the industry that Fanuc take care of, the the overall support, the the mm. legacy that Fanuc really is. If you could touch on some of that oh, man. to maybe convey the message of why a machine shop out there might want to lean in your direction. One hundred percent, dude. And I'm and I'm going to tell you guys this too. Like I I can cover my 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 name badge for this too because I don't I don't think Fanuc's the best because I work at Fanuc. I work at Fanuc because I think it's the best. Mm -hmm. So well when, I, when I used to work at, at the other integration firms, they were not all Fanuc, all right? I got to program the Epsons, the Denzos, um, tinkered with the Universals, got to play with some weird Chinese knockoff brands. You know, I got, I got to play with other stuff. Uh, and there is a reason Fanuc's number one. Um, so the, the big thing about Fanuc, more than any other company, um, is the level of support. Mm -hmm. And it's something that Fanuc has uh, invested just millions and millions of dollars in. Um, and, and let me tell you a little bit about that is Fanuc is the only robotics company on earth that has a U.S. based, a United States based development team. So every other brand you work with, China, Europe, Denmark, it's, it's all overseas. Uh, Fanuc has Fanuc USA product development. And what's cool about that is if you have a question about, like let's say you had your Dell laptop open and, it, and you had a, a problem, it'd be like calling Bill Gates and saying, hey, Bill, w hmm. WTF, fix this. You can do that with Fanuc. You can call the guy who wrote the code on that robot and he or she will tell you, this is what we gotta do. And if it's, if, if it's not an easy fix, we make the patch. Uh, Fanuc has 25 facilities just in North North America alone. I think it's 230-ish, 237-ish globally. Um, and so we're, we're, we're regionally supported for support structure. We've got 24-7, 365 call support. So when you, when you have a problem, dude, you can call us at 2 a.m. Christmas Eve. Hey, I got this problem. You know you're getting an answer from our team. Um, we've got... Uh, actually, I'll tell you another fun part. Fanuc is the only robotics company on earth that guarantees parts for life. For life. Wow. We never obsolete anything ever. For your for your CNCs, your robo drills, your injection molding machines, your robots, you could have a 40-year-old machine that has a punch card reader on it. Your punch card goes out, you call us, we'll sell you a new punch card reader. That's, yeah. that's Well, I've, I've done a couple of interviews with people who are trying to do that, and additive manufacturing comes in a lot in those yep. parts that aren't being made anymore, but yep. the only one in the world. I mean, yep. you're really throwing down some stats yep. today, Adam. Dude, I dude, like it. Dude, Fanuc's, Fanuc's the real deal, man, and and that's the thing. Like, you buy a Fanuc, you buy it once. You know, you, you buy it, you have it for life. And 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 actually, that that's it's it can be tricky, too, because some of the other robots out there, they get recurring sales because their stuff's it breaks down you know it's engineered mm -hmm. to wear out right you know that's why do you think you buy a new iphone every two years it's because they turn down the old one right mm -hmm. with with fanic i i go places where i walk in the door and they've got a fanic that's older than my wife and it's still running <laughs> and i'm not that much of a cradle robber i'm just saying <laughs> but but they've you know they've, they've got robots that are you know 30 Fantastic. 30 years old <laughs> and they're kicking ass they're running they're they're working they're humming along i'm like hey have you thought about replacing it nope runs great. I'm like, cool, call me if you need anything. So, you know, that's what I'd say. Now, I really lean on support with Fanuc, and I'm, I'm actually, I'm actually going to use this pr platform for the next 20 seconds to tell you this, because, and I will cover my name badge for this, because I've worked with a lot of different brands, okay? 
And the best three robot brands in an unbiased, I don't care what my W2 says, unbiased opinion, the best three brands are ABB, KUKA, and Fanuc. It's the, the Swiss, the Germans, and the Japanese, okay? Then there's this whole middle tier of people that are like decent robots, your Epson, your Denso, your Stobli, your Yamaha, Yaskawa, all that kind of stuff kind of hangs in the middle like, yeah, it's okay. Then you got just like the throwaway robots, which in my opinion are like the universals and things like that where, sorry, I'm just going to say it. They're just a junk robot. I don't care who I work for. They're just not good. Um, and so how Fanuc gets ahead is support because I just said ABB and KUKA are pretty awesome. Those are 30, 40 year robots, they'll last your whole life. They've got great technology. So why doesn't anyone buy ABB and KUKA? They don't have the support. You call for programming help, tough luck. You need spare parts, eh, sorry. You know, so that's where Fanuc puts its, you know, not only have, has Fanuc been around, we just celebrated our uh, 45th uh, year anniversary. So we're one, yeah, yeah, as a company, one of the oldest ones, we sold our one millionth robot last year. Congratulations yeah, again. One million robots on, on the planet. Um, so, you know, we've been around, we've paid our dues, best technology, best support. Dude, I, I really can't say enough good things about Fanuc as a company. That was really wonderfully said, and you even had me chuckling a couple of times as well. <laughs> You're talking about support. I want to expand on that a little bit because, you know, Robbie K with Aceta is a good friend of ours. You mm. got the Methods Machine Tools guys who we both work with as well. You know, the, you, you have integrators. You have partners yes. as well. Yes. So when we're talking about service and support, where do they come into play? Business owners work hard, work hard, and they just don't accumulate any wealth. And it's hard to meet people or do much if I'm working all the time. So he's asking for help, and he thinks he's going out of it. The reason I got into this business is so I could help other people. Because I remember how much I needed someone to come alongside me when I own my shop, and now I have the privilege where I can do that for other people. Oh, 100%. So, you know, Fanuc, we're, our world begins and ends with a robot. Now, a robot is a really nice boat anchor until you do something with it. <laughs> I've seen some that aren't moving in the corner of shops. Not yes, necessarily yes. Fanuc, but I've seen them as boat anchors. Dude, I'm, I'll tell you what. I can, I can sell one robot to Company A and one robot to Company B, and Company A can make millions of dollars with it, and Company B can set it in a corner. Okay? And so a robot's a boat anchor. It truthfully is until somebody puts end of arm tooling on it and put sensors on it and, and air and, and electric and pneumatics and programming and makes it work. Where that magic comes from is our integration partners. Yeah. And Fanuc has invested, I, actually I'll give you another fun stat. Can you tell I'm a numbers guy? I feel, Absolutely, I'm, I'm really feel, glad you I'm, are though. I'm starting to feel like Mike Ross from Suits. <laughs> um, so, He's brilliant as well, uh, yeah, good yeah, little TV yeah, show. I know, right? Yeah, I love it, man. <laughs> um, so. Uh, uh, Fanuc, we started a program called the Authorized System Integrator Program, ASI. And Fanuc was like, okay, we're making these robots. We can't program them all. We need a, an army mm -hmm. to, to do this. So we train and certify and grow these integration firms um, all over the world, but certainly all over in America, that they will buy our robots and then integrate them for the end customer, right? So if you wanted to make you know, more of these Darth Vader helmets, you don't necessarily have to be a robot guy. You just got to hire the robot guy mm -hmm. and get your machine running, and then life is good. You got Darth Vader helmets. Um, when we started the program in 1992, our integrators purchased uh, 430, I want to say it was 437 robots in, our, in their first year. Cumulatively, since 92, our integrators have purchased over 83,000 robots. So... Yeah. So just our integrators make up a tenth of our business. I just told you we sold a million robots, yeah. right? They're, they're almost 100,000 100, of it. So these integration firms are the value add middleman that help company X deploy robots. Because not everyone is a robot wizard or a mechanical guy or electrical guy. Like you got to hire the guy to do it, you know? Or maybe you are mechanical, but you don't have time, mm -hmm. right? Like my wife is like, hey, we got to redo the kitchen cabinets. I can redo kitchen cabinets. I ain't got the time. So mm -hmm. now I got to hire the cabinet guy to come and do the cabinet, right? Same thing with robots. You know, I know people who are very well capable of doing a robot. They got to hire an integrator to get in there and get the job done. 
That's very well said and, and explained. It helped me see, helps me understand it as well. I'm sure the audience, you know, I'm going to pick your brain one more time because yeah. I'm really enjoying your insight, Adam. I got to be honest. It's truly, you know, one of the best conversations I've had about robotics. So thank you for doing that. Now, you mentioned part of your territory is the Caribbean, I believe, right? See, sí, see. Sí. Sí. Uh, not everyone in the Caribbean speaks Spanish, but see, sí, claro. Uh, um, claro. Yep. <clears throat> I travel the world often mm -hmm. and. There are conversations, whether they're true or not, there are conversations where countries like Japan, Korea, the US, the UK, Germany, Switzerland, these countries are fairly well adapted to automation. Even if we could make the, the discussion that the US were still trying to pick mm -hmm. up our automation game. And then I'll travel to places like Mexico, Indonesia, mm -hmm. Vietnam, Philippines, mm -hmm. Malaysia, these places where they still have very low wages and can just throw people at mm -hmm. machines instead of automation. Mm -hmm. What would you say to an audience out there listening to this right now in one of those countries where you would say, look, I know you have people, but this is why automation will benefit you as well. Oh, God, dude, I'm so glad you said that, and I wish we had another hour. So, <laughs> me and, me, dude, me bro, too. Bro, can you come so back good. at some point? Yeah, we can do a part two to this. We're going to do a part two. So, America's way behind in automation. Um, the, I'm going to give you another stat. It's, it's fun that I have these. So, uh, Thank you, Mark in, Russ. In, 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 yeah, right? <laughs> so, section 49B slash paragraph 2. Um, in America, the ratio of human workers in manufacturing compared to robots, there are 1,100 humans for every robot. So it's 1,100 people to one robot in manufacturing. You go to South Korea, you go to uh, China, uh, it's more like a hundred to one. Okay. Big so difference. that means huge. Yeah. That, that, that means that the number of robots compared to the number of humans, they have 10 X what we have. Yeah. So why do you think they can make stuff so cheap? Right. You know, some of it is material cost, but a lot of it is they're not putting bodies on it. Okay. So now let's flip the script and talk about the Caribbean, right? Let's, and before yeah, we do okay. real quick, I would just, I would make the hesitated guess to go that people are still miscommunicated on that information thinking that they're still selling people at it over in China. Oh, yeah. And no, that's just not, not the case. It's no. automation. That's, they're, they're, that's a great step. Thank ten, you. They're 10x ahead of us. Yeah. 10X. Okay. So Caribbean. Yeah. So, so now you go to the Caribbean. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, there's a company in the Dominican that makes um, uh, the, the plasma machine. So when you donate blood, uh, you get one poke. And you fill up an IV bag or two or three or whatever. And hey, it goes in a freezer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. When you donate plasma, you get two pokes, all right? One is to draw the blood, then the blood goes through a machine, there's a centrifuge, the centrifuge that separates the plasma from the blood, and then puts the blood back in another port. So it's out of you, into a machine, back into you. If they're pumping something into your veins, can you imagine the level of cleanliness that that machine has to be built in right. spec to, right? right? Okay, so when you're in the Dominican and people are working for 50 cents an hour, and they work hard. They don't care the, about that dirt, do they? Dude, I mean, they work and they work hard, but you go to these places, it's like, dude, you gotta have all these provisions and measures for clean rooms and wash down mm -hmm. and all these inspections and FDA, da 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 da. Or you slap a robot on there, dude. An IP69 clean room robot with FDA grease, stainless steel fittings, and let that robot build that machine. And that thing will always be whisper, whisper clean, particulate free, and it works 24 hours, and you don't have to worry about it. And those workers, now they can just be shuttling things in and out when they're needed and when they're done. Let them be material handlers, not assemblers. So in the Caribbean, huge market for medical, huge. I mean, I mean, you've got the, the Medtronic, uh, Fresenius, um, Johnson and Johnson, Baxter. Um, it's it, it's it's amazing how much medical is in the Caribbean. Yeah, that's also Tons fascinating. I didn't know that. Yeah. I knew the part about the clean room and stuff yeah. and how important yeah. it was. I didn't yeah. realize it was a lot yeah. sitting in the Caribbean. A lot. There, that, there used to be huge tax incentives to to bring the business down there. I know the government's done some weird, wacky things, and I'm not a politician, so I don't know. But <laughs> but because of that, there was, a, there was a time where all these businesses just grew like crazy on the islands. So when we both transition from our current careers, you want to start a automated machine shop in the island somewhere? Let's do it. Yeah, Absolutely. I think we could do this right. together. Yeah. I, 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 private I, jet. Uh, yeah. And you say you couldn't sell th anything as a Boy Scout, but you sold 
me on this idea. So very well, it's that solution based mentality, there you right? Go. See, I didn't sell you a business. I sold you a solution. It's now an we're idea. Make a business oh gosh, yeah. We're gonna do this. We'll bring Christian along too. We'll figure out what he could do later. We'll figure that out. He's he's already in love with manufacturing. He's a smart dude. All right. So is there anything before we slide into these games? As we have a few minutes left, is there anything that I didn't ask you today that you think because I too would like another hour, but we don't I have know, it. Right? Um, is there anything I didn't ask you today? Any messages you'd like to convey? Anything about Fanic, your own journey uh, to the kids out there? Anything that you'd like to say? Yep. I think the last thing I would like to say is um, I want to just touch on mentor-mentee relationships. Okay. Um, it is it is my personal belief in this world that knowledge is the one thing you can give and give and give and never run out of. Let that sink in. Like if you needed cash, I could give you cash, but now I have less cash. If you need to know how to program a robot, I can teach you how to program a robot. Now we both know how to program robots. And so I would be nowhere near where I am today if it were for, weren't for the people who mentored me along the way, the guys at JR and R&D and Fanic Charlotte and and now even the, the guys on my Fanic sales team. I've learned so much from my peers, the guys in the other territories that I shadowed and, and learned from. And um, I've always looked up to the generation before me. And now I'm finally in a position and I'm, I'm doing it uh, in a lot of different ways, uh, YouTube and, and, and STEM clubs and, and all things like that. Um, passing it on to the generation below me is, dude, if I can give you a hand up, I'm going to give you a hand up. So my, my, my big message is if you're a veteran and you're experienced, it's not that knowledge is power. It's knowledge is a gift that's meant to be shared. And if you're young and you're getting started, go find the crotchety old guy who's smoking the cigarettes in the corner and and ping him and and figure out what he's learned. Because that old dude in the corner with the nicotine stained fingers, that dude knows some stuff, man. Pick his brain. Christian, we did not set that up, did we? And have you heard that same stereotype before? Every time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Everyone knows that guy. In the, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. What it's, you just described, Christian's heard three or four times. As, that, that we guy, all know that guy. That guy has the big, thir- like, 40-ounce <laughs> thermos. <of coffee. laughs> You're like, dude, let me please buy you a drink. We need to talk. You know, yeah, like that, yeah. Because that guy has lived. And I'm going to tell you, there are so many things in this industry you can't get from a book. Yeah. You can't just read it and know it and be good at it. It's not A, then B, then C. It's... When you learn engineering, all you're doing is putting tools in your tool belt. Now you got to go and solve these problems with the tools that you've earned. You know, um, a lot of times the solution are things that have never been done before. Like I said, it, it starts from thin air and you turn it into reality. Um, yeah, that doesn't come out of a book. That's that's from experience and other people in the room. So, you know, stay humble. It's very humbling. You, you can't always be the smartest guy in the room. Um, but but yeah, definitely share that and, and breed the next generation of manufacturing. You know, I read a fantasy fi- speaking of something that does come out of a book, I ran yeah. a fantasy read a fantasy fiction one time and uh, the idea was that automation at some point will will do so much for us that we will only need to work about four hours in a week mm-hmm. and we'll start exchanging knowledge for the same financial return oh, as man. as we do for working currently. <laughs> so really cool concept that I, I enjoyed in that book but i thought you might like that as well all right you ready to play a couple of games and then we'll do a toast do you have a toast in your mind as well i do man awesome let's do it all right so the first game we're going to play is called would you rather if you've been listening to this show before now um you know exactly what this game is but if this is your first time would you rather is that i give adam or any guest uh but today is adam uh a couple of scenarios that are not perfect neither one but he gets to decide which one he likes best and he'll give us a short reason why is uh, time is drawing near to the end, even though we want this to last forever. Mm-hmm. And I, I have about 40 of them on here. So, oh, I And know. I haven't picked the one that you either do or don't want. I'm just going to pick one. What's your favorite number? My favorite number, uh, nine. Nine. Okay, we're going to go with nine to start. Would you rather work at a noisy but exciting steel mill or a quiet, clean semiconductor lab? <sighs> That's tough because I've done both. Um, I'd say I would rather be the quiet, clean semiconductor lab. Yeah, yeah, I like I both would. as well. Yeah, one of them makes me want to shout like a like I'm a caveman, yeah. like, <laughs> <laughs> and the other one I feel I feel like proper like I'm. What am I? Well, anyway, if you, if you haven't noticed, I'm a loud guy. I'm I'm loud and talkative, right? And so it's hard for me to sit still and be yeah. quiet. So sometimes the 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 big noisy you know steel mill. Hey, John, what are you doing? Yeah, whatever you know. That's kind of fun. You razz each other, but uh, I think like long term, I'd rather like. 
I put my headphones in, zone in, and you know, really get wired in. As I'm just, getting older, for sure. I was gonna say, I think it's age. If you would ask me that question ten years ago, we're gonna be like, still, still mellow. Mellow. What the hell? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now it's like, now I'm slowly just one pack of cigarettes <laughs> to be that guy we just described. <laughs> Give me ten yeah. more years. A, couple, a little bit bigger mug yeah. we got here. Yeah. All right, second favorite number. Uh, what's my range? All the way up to forty. Twenty-one. Twenty-one. Would you rather work on manufacturing in extreme conditions like Antarctica or in a comfortable climate-controlled factory? Take a guess. Uh, you got control. <laughs> you, I see, I want to go to Antarctica. <laughs> I, I think a boat ride would make me sick, but I want to see some penguins and do some manufacturing down there. Dude, I, I lived in Antarctica for 25 years. They call it West Michigan. Yeah. And I never want to do, do it again. <laughs> okay, that was an easy one for you. Now we're going to do industry jargon because yes. I don't know how detailed this will get. And again, we're running short on time. Okay. Um, I do have a couple of good ones here for you. However, I'm gonna nah, let's do let's do this one. This one's kind of simple. It's probably real easy for you. In layman's terms, what is a gripper in robotics? Okay. So in layman's term, a gripper on a robot is a tool that is going to pick up an object. It is something that'll mount onto the end of the robot and grab whatever part you need so that you can pick and place it. About as simple as I can do that. Yeah, right? other than just saying it's like robot fingers. Oh, that's even simpler. Damn. <laughs> okay, you won that one. <laughs> no, All right, you, it wasn't a game one. for me. No, no, no. no. If, if there was a chalkboard, word, <laughs> robot fingers. It wasn't I'm sitting here, I'm sitting here writing a Webster dictionary. <laughs> well, it's this and this and this. You're like, it's, it's fingers, dude. It's fingers. <laughs> All right, we're, we're going with fingers. <laughs> Steve right. Harvey, give me fingers. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. All right, you got it. Number one yeah, answer. Number one answer was fingers. <laughs> for Family Feud? Yeah, and mine was like, <laughs> no, come on. All right. So this is number two. All right, try me again. All right. What does work cell mean in the context of robotics explained simply? Ooh, nice. <laughs> I got to do it simply, right? Yeah. All right. I'm going to do it simply. Uh, you know when you have a playpen and you put your baby in the playpen with all the toys and everything's all confined to that one area? Mm -hmm. That's a work That's cell. That's a work cell. Yeah, and we fenced it off and everything and put little alarms so you can't get in or out. That's exactly yeah. right. All right, Adam, you've done a wonderful job today. Benjamin, my friend, how are you today, sir? Would you mind bringing over one of those delicious bourbons for us as Adam has chosen bourbon between scotch oh, and tequila yeah. for all you mm -hmm. people out there watching and listening. Leave in the comments what you would like to try if you have the opportunity to join me on the Gun Show VIP edition. Ben, you're always a gentleman and a scholar. I know this isn't your job, but you're, we appreciate you so much, so thank you for that. Adam, do you have a toast for me, brother? I, I do, and I'm going to set the table before I say it. Okay. All right, so my favorite quote is actually from Robin Williams, and uh, he said... Uh, I'm not sure how much value I have in this universe, but I do know that I've made a few people happier than they would have been if they hadn't known me. And as long as I know that, I'm as rich as I ever have to be. Mm. And so what I would like to toast is, may we all live a life that makes those around us just a little bit happier. I absolutely love that, Adam. Thank you so much for your time. Mm. That's a nice four roses. As I Beautiful. open this show, I also have a closing that I'd like to read as well. It's not quite memorized yet. Let's see if I stumble over any of the words. Mm -hmm. uh, but from my heart, before I read this to close out, Adam, um, thank you so much, man. Thanks, you have brother. been a joy, a pleasure talking to you on the phone before you came to here. Uh, I really enjoy your energy. I hope and know the audience does as well. Um, and yeah, let's plan on a part two. What do you say? I would love that, dude. This was way too much fun, man. <laughs> this is great. We'll do it. I part like your two. excitement. All right. As we draw this enlightening journey to a close, I want to extend a heartfelt thank you for sharing your time with us. It's our hope that today's conversation has not only illuminated the intricacy the intricate world of manufacturing, but also highlighted its profound significance. As we navigate through our daily lives, surrounded by the marvels of human ingenuity. <laughs> ingenuity. <laughs> there it is. I had to say it again just because I messed up in the beginning. It's essential to remember the vital role manufacturing plays in shaping our world. Our discussion today goes beyond just understanding the processes and technologies. It's about fostering a deeper appreciation and awareness of this field. The need to bring manufacturing into the limelight in our educational institutions, particularly middle schools and high schools, cannot be overstated. By introducing our younger generation to the wonders and opportunities in manufacturing, we are opening doors to innovation, creativity, and the future where they can be architects of the very world they inhabit. So, as we part ways, let's carry forward the message of importance of manufacturing. Let's inspire, educate, and ignite a passion for this field and the hearts of our youth, because in doing so, 
we are not just talking about manufacturing. We are talking about building a better, more innovative and sustainable future for us all. Thank you once again for joining us. And until next time, keep exploring, keep learning and keep supporting the remarkable world of manufacturing. So the great game of business is is not magic. It, you know, it's it's a it's a discipline. This dude has sold out. He's given up his private life. He's all in. Yeah, they work 60, 70, 80, 90 hours a week and they're paying themselves 50 grand and last time they took a vacation was 1998. And uh, you watch your kids grow up from a distance and you see all this and then at the end of the day you got X amount of cash in your hand. You're like, but I'm working really hard. The reason I got into this business is because I remember how bad it hurt uh, when I owned my own shop and I was there alone and no one was there to help me. Well guys, uh, you've brought MTD in. We're excited to be here. I want you to share your, a, a story that you, of you helping someone. So me personally, I cannot wait to visit this shop with you guys. So should we go pay this young man a visit? I think so. Let's, Let's do, do it. it. Let's Come do on, it. guys. We know you can help us build the future we want. I, don't know, I, I guess at the end of the day, long term, we want a company that is sustainable and can help uh, everybody involved, your families and our employees, and us, of course. It's something I could hand down to my kids and to maybe not work so much, you know. I know what he's going through, and I know we can help him.